Okay, so today we're going to be discussing transporting data at warp speed, uh, as I like to call it, uh, because I'm a big Trek fan. Uh, hopefully there are at least a couple others out there who are willing to admit that. I'm, I guess that's kind of loud and proud anymore, but uh, uh, yeah, so how to connect Spring Boot apps quickly, powerfully, and painlessly. And this actually has application outside of the Spring realm, but of course it applies most uh, most forcefully within the, the Spring Boot realm because it's uh, I'm, I'm fully convinced uh, that it is the best way in, to consume many, many different options or to leverage many different options uh, for, for transporting your data around within distributed systems. So we're going to be covering some of those things today, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, again, my name is Mark Heckler. I'm a principal cloud advocate of Java and JVM languages now with Microsoft. Uh, again, I, I do heavily work with uh, Spring Technologies at Microsoft and and love them. There's no uh, no problem at all with that. Uh, so um, yeah, so this is good. This is kind of one of my uh, a couple of my passions rolled into one. I am a Java champion, Kotlin developer expert, and here is how to reach me if you have questions, comments, or feedback afterward. Uh, if you're like me, you think of the best questions or the best comments. 10 minutes after you switch over to the next track or, or you, you walk out to hit the restroom or, or just you walk away, right? Uh, so, so please do reach out to me. Email is good. Twitter is better. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I'm practically always on Twitter. Uh, the same can't be said for email. But if you don't follow me on Twitter, I guess the first question I'd ask is why? Why are you not following me on Twitter? Uh, but anyway, yeah, reach out to me on Twitter. If you have questions, comments, or feedback you want to share publicly, just just tweet them. Uh, if you don't want to necessarily share your your thoughts with the whole world in, in one sitting, uh, then by all means, uh, follow me, send me a DM. Even if I haven't seen you come through yet, I will get that DM. My DMs are open. So a little bit about me. I um, am an author. I have co-authored a couple of books, contributed content and code to several other books. I also did something I swore I would never do after co-authoring a couple of books. I wrote my own book. Um, so um, yeah, I guess I kind of did write the book on Spring Boot, one of the books on Spring Boot. I just felt that uh, I, I, you know, different perspectives add different things, and I felt like there were some certain things that I wanted to cover, and and every author chooses, you know, maybe a different balance of things. So um, yeah, I published this earlier this year, or O'Reilly published it, I guess I should say earlier this year, uh, but it was absolutely a thrill to work on this and to provide maybe a uh, a different perspective on introducing uh, developers to Spring or to broaden and deepen their knowledge of Spring with Java and Kotlin. Uh, I am an architect and developer uh, and, of course, developer advocate, uh, Java champion, Java One Rockstar, Kotlin developer expert, a uh, few other honors and awards that uh, still mean I have to get my own coffee, which trained me well for the pandemic because, yeah, I'm getting my own coffee all the time now. So it's, it's all good. Life kind of prepares you, right? I'm also a licensed pilot, which is something that... Um, I feel like is good when you stretch your brain in different ways. Uh, becoming a pilot actually challenges you mentally and physically somewhat, of course. But but uh, when you're flying on instruments and things like that, it does challenge you mentally. It does also, when you're not flying on instruments, when you're flying in visual flight rules, allow you to see the world from a little different perspective, a few thousand feet up. Uh, interestingly, in the U.S., we, uh, we use uh, feet for altitude. Uh, we use nautical miles and statute miles for distance. We use inches of mercury for uh, barometric pressure. But then we also use Celsius uh, for temp. So I, I don't know. It's it's kind of an interesting mix, but it keeps life interesting, right? Uh, if you are interested in knowing more about the book, checking it out, uh, follow the link. It takes you to a Riley site. You can even get a free trial, I think, of uh, Safari Books Online and just check it out. Hope you like it. So today, the plan for today, I, I, I love a good quote, and this is by Leonard Bernstein, the uh, former... Uh, conductor and uh, the New York Philharmonic uh, decades ago, I guess, uh, as well as a composer. Uh, he wrote, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. And that's always the case, isn't it? I'm going to set my timer right now. Hopefully I won't uh, won't exceed the time limit, but we'll see, right? We'll, uh, we'll do our best and uh, we'll see where that takes us. So not quite enough time, a lot of material. Let's get moving. So the, the actual plan for today, distilled, are a few different things. One, we'll talk about HTTP-based interactions, and I won't dwell on those because I think those are kind of the cost of admission, right? Those are table stakes. Most of us have done uh, some kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, what we typically refer to, even though it's a little bit of a, a misnomer, REST APIs, right? Um, but if we have HTTP-based inter interactions that we've defined, um, we're, I mean, this is probably something that's fairly common. If you haven't done that, that's perfectly fine. 
Um, you will, <laughs> but uh, but we'll you know we, I'm happy to discuss this offline with you at a later date. However, we're going to launch into from there a bit of talk and code using reactive streams, specifically Project Reactor, which is an implementation of the reactive streams uh, specification. And there are multiple specific or multiple implementations. The reactive stream specification was meant to be a just a a very uh, granular uh, set of guidelines, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, the, the Reactive Streams initiative includes the, uh, the API, uh, the examples for how to, to create implementations, a TCK. Uh, you've got a lot of things there that actually enable you to develop an implementation that is verifiably uh, interoperable with other implementations. Reactor is, is the one that Pivotal and VMware actually led with. However, uh, it's got broad community support, large industry support, outsized industry support. So there are a lot of commercial as well as open source APIs built on Project Reactor. And of course, Spring Webflux builds on Reactor and incorporates it into Spring itself. Uh, we'll be discussing that and coding that. We'll talk about RSocket because RSocket allows you to cross the network boundary and do it in a way that in, in effect, um, I don't want to say it destroys the network boundary, it doesn't ignore it, uh, but it certainly makes it less of an obstacle when it comes to inter uh, inter-service communication, inter inter app communication, uh, based on TCP and WebSocket and Aeron and and so on and so forth. But uh, we'll focus on a couple of those here today. Again, time, messaging. We'll talk about and we'll we'll develop uh, some some code, uh, we'll write some code using RabbitMQ. I'll also, in order to make things a little bit more robust, because I'm just running a local RabbitMQ instance, but I actually want to use a cloud instance of Azure Event Hubs. Uh, Azure Event Hubs exposes a Kafka API, and it allows me to kind of show Rabbit, show Kafka, and it, it, it's just so uh, so easy to connect when it comes to using, uh, again, Spring-based technologies. These are, None of these things in and of themselves are specific to Spring, but uh, Spring Boot and, and various Spring projects make it super easy to consume them and to use them as a developer so you can focus on the things you want to get done and need to get done. Again, and then after that, we'll have a summary, virtual hugs, and we'll share resources, whatever. So let's code. Uh, so that got us 10 minutes in, tops, and we're off to the code, which is, I think, pretty good, right? Pretty good start. So I'm going to uh, recharge here, get some jet fuel. There we go, okay. So I'm going to go here and start off, I, I, Anytime you do a, a demonstration, anytime you do a, a, a demo, you have to come up with some kind of um, a, a relevant, I feel like, I, I, I'm always more interested in things that make sense to me or that, that have real world data and real world applicability. So what I've done, I guess let me uh, let me flip over to this and show this. Again, I'm a pilot and, and I have uh, in the US and, and most, I think pretty much around the globe in some form or another, there's some way of, of tracking uh, flight information. So if a, a United Airlines or Lufthansa flight or, or whatever is flying, uh, then they provide position reports like once a minute uh, to ground-based stations. Uh, and of course, there's radar and all this, but this helps to uh, helps the controllers to deconflict airways, right? So it helps keep planes from in trying to inhabit the same space at the same time, which is generally a good thing, right? Um, so in the US, that's called ADSB, uh, Automated Dependent Surveillance Broadcast uh, System, I guess it is. Uh, and, and that provides just a blip of information every so often. So you can keep track of where a, an aircraft is at that point in time. Uh, let me see if I can find, yeah. So here, here's the kind of information you'd see, the call sign of the aircraft, the squawk code or the transponder code, which uniquely identifies that aircraft, at least for that particular flight or that particular leg of that flight. Uh, the registration number, which is the actual country registration for that particular aircraft. The flight number, so if it's uh, Delta Airlines 521 or something. Uh, the route, which may be uh, JFK to Houston or, or, or JFK to Houston to LAX or whatever. Uh, the type of aircraft, the category of aircraft. Then you have things like your altitude, that it's currently where it currently is, the heading that it's on. So if it's flying directly west, it's heading 270. The airspeed in knots uh, for the U.S., uh, and then the vertical rate, whether it's climbing or descending and by how much. The selected altitude, which is the, the destination altitude. If the, the targeted altitude is at 37,000 feet, but it has just taken off, that aircraft's just taken off, maybe it's at 7,000 feet and it's climbing. And the vertical rate would be positive and the selected altitude would be lower or the higher. And then the alt current altitude would be lower, but getting there, right? 
uh, the latitude, the longitude, the current position, the barometric pressure. And, and there's a lot of other information here, most of which we don't necessarily care about for this particular demo, but it's, you know, it's in there, right? So uh, I've defined a couple of very, uh, very, just a very basic uh, API here, one of which is an HTTP based endpoint called aircraft. And then one is a uh, and our socket endpoint uh, called AC stream. And we'll use those as we go through, because again, live data is the best data. And this allows me to, uh, I actually have this running. I have this application running. Let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, I've, I've created a native image, a spring native image, and I'm running this in a Docker container. Uh, and it, it started up in, eh, you know, under 0.4 seconds. So that's just terribly slow, right? But but there it is, you know, it's it's running. <laughs> so if I do want to try this out, uh, let's see if I do HTTP uh, 7634 slash aircraft, I can see that I'm getting, hopefully getting aircraft, the current position reports within my area. Now that the small device that I have just pulls in within a small range of miles. So I just get a just a handful of flights that are active at this point in time. But you know, that's good information. Here's a Delta Airlines flight. It's currently at 36,000 feet. The heading is 264, so almost directly west. Uh, the barometer reading for some reason isn't coming through. Once in a while, the data just doesn't feed through. Uh, but you get uh, you get some good information here. So, so we're going to be using that. Um, and to do that and to show the different ways that a distributed system, that the, the components within a distributed system can communicate and transport their data at warp speed, I'm going to create a few things, right? And, and I struggled with what to call these for, for a few reasons, and I'll get into that as we code, but let's just start off and create thing one, thing two, and thing three. This kind of reminds me of the children's book uh, where you have thing one and thing two. I, I frankly think we shouldn't have just stopped it too because why not, right? The more things, the merrier. Uh, so I'm gonna use uh, Java and Maven just as kind of a, keeping it down the middle of the road. But again, if you're a hipster, please feel free to use Gradle. Uh, I like Kotlin too, Groovy's good. Uh, but we're going to stay kind of in the the the, the broadest uh, path, if you will, and stay with Java and Maven for this example. Current version is Spring Boot, which is 2.6.0, the current production version. I'm going to change this to the hecklers because I can. We're going to call this thing one. Uh, and I'm just gonna, going to just say, hey, it's thing one. Uh, packaging will be jar. Uh, it is 2021 now, right? Or 2020 part two. <laughs> so we'll go with jar packaging. There's no reason really to, to, to go back to war, even though it is supported. We'll stay with jar. Java 11, we can go up to Java 17 or back to Java 8. I find most people are still parked on 11. So we'll stay with that for now. Again, kind of staying middle of the road. We don't have to do anything fancy. It just all works, right? So I'm going to uh, bring in reactive web as a dependency and R socket uh, because I want to use R socket as well. And then I'm going to uh, include Lombok because I'm a lazy developer. Lazy good, I wanna be very clear about that, not lazy bad. Uh, and I'm going to just use that to create my, my thing one. And this is how I generate the, the actual project structure. Uh, this doesn't actually give me um, uh, any uh, code generation other than the main method, main application class main method, but this gets me off to a running start. So I'm going to create thing one. And then in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and create thing two and thing three as well. Now, I do want to add a couple of dependencies because between thing two and thing three, I'm going to maybe add, add some different ways of, of communicating and connecting that data. I'm going to use Spring Cloud Stream. Uh, and Spring Cloud Stream, as it says here, let me zoom in on that a bit. It's a framework for building highly scalable event-driven microservices connected with shared messaging systems. However, it requires a binder because you have to tell it exactly which messaging system you want to use, which kind of makes sense. Uh, Kafka, RabbitMQ, Solace, PubSub Plus, and more, right? So I'm going to uh, choose CloudStream, whoops, and then I'm also going to bring in the RabbitMQ driver as well, binder. So let's go ahead and generate that. That gets us thing two. We'll drop that in the same place. And then let's go ahead and we'll change this to thing three and the name to thing three. And we'll do the same thing. And that gets us, I think, set up pretty well for what we want to accomplish. So let's go ahead and open up thing one. Where are you, thing one? Where did you go? Oh, IntelliJ, what are you doing to me? Okay, so so it didn't open that up. That's uh, that's interesting, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so let's see if I can just go to the show and finder. 
oh boy, it's really, uh, really messing with me today. So let's bring this over and let's go here and we'll just do this the hard way, hard way. <laughs> it's so manual. All right. So I'm going to open this up. I use IntelliJ, but use whatever makes you happy. Uh, you know, VS Code is a great alternative. Uh, there's obviously Eclipse and NetBeans. Uh, you can even use Vim should you want to, but please don't use Emacs. Have some self-respect. Okay, so I'm going to start off and create thing one. And thing one will do a couple of things. It will, <laughs> no, no pun intended, uh, thing one serves as a client for our plane finder, which is out there running, again, right here, uh, right here as a, a native image in a container. And we're going to use thing one to communicate with that and provide an API to other services within our distributed application. We're considering at this point, Plane Finder as our external API that we're going to be querying. So uh, I'm going to just uh, close this out and we're going to open our palm. Oh, uh, stunning performance this morning here. No, well, let's try our application properties. No, it's just not uh, not working at all. Okay, so isn't that interesting? Okay, so I'm going to just close this out and we'll try one more time. <laughs> I'm really not sure what's happening here. You can always tell live demos because things do not work as they're intended to work. Okay, loading, loading. Ah, isn't that interesting? Okay, so so I'm going to try something else here. Um, so I, wow, I've just never seen this. Okay, so let's let's trash this. Let's open this again. Let's unzip this, and let's open this one more time. And IntelliJ is just uh, not playing well this morning. I think someone's punking me or something. Oh, no, 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 no. Ah, there we go. Okay, so I think that looks a little better. Let's pull up the palm. There we go. Okay. Whew. Not quite sure what happened there, but... Uh, but we'll go with it. All right, so there's our palm. Uh, we see our dependencies here. I guess I should go back and look at that really quickly. All our dependencies are as we would expect them to be, which is good, right? No surprises there, even if it did take us a little longer to get here for whatever reason. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, define a couple of properties that our application will use. Now, the default for the startup for a Spring Boot application is 8080. So server.port Normally the default is 8080. I'm going to, in order to avoid port conflicts, since we're going to be having multiple applications running, I'm going to set this for 9090. And then I also want to um, set my RSocket port, server port to 9091. I like to keep them together. That's not a, a have to thing. It's just a convention that I follow because I think it uh, keeps my thinking straight, right? Uh, hopefully, or helps to do that. So. Let's get started. I'm going to just define a class here. Uh, we'll call this aircraft. And we're going to just pull some information from our um, aircraft API that we're using from Plane Finder. So we'll have some things like a call sign that we care about and a, a registration number and a flight number and a type, type. And then we'll have uh, something like our, uh, we want to grab our altitude because that's kind of important to see, right? Our heading and our airspeed so we can see which way we're headed, how high we are in the air and, and what speed we're, we're moving along. Uh, and then of course we want to have specifically our position, right? So our lap and lawn. Now I'm going to use Lombok again. I'm a lazy developer. At data tells Lombok to create this as a data class, similar to a Kotlin data class, right? Uh, it gets you your getters, setters, equals, hash code, and two string methods. And I'm going to ignore any properties that come through that we don't need, because we know there are many that will come through potentially, but we don't care about those. So I'm going to now create a, um, a REST controller, uh, and we'll call this class our thing three controller. And let's start by just defining a very quick uh, get mapping here, and we'll call this a request response. 
and we'll return a single value. Now, when you're talking about uh, HTTP-based interactions, typically you return a thing, right? And this goes to methods or APIs, a thing, so an object of type T, or maybe a, a bunch of things of type T, right? So you might return an iterable of type T. So you typically return zero or one values, you know, there's something there or not, or a collection of values. Now, uh, within the reactive space, you have a similar construct, right? So the reactive streams initiative actually just defines a publisher, which can return zero to n. Uh, it's just open-ended. However, uh, we're very accustomed to, and there's a great amount of utility in uh, creating APIs that will return a, exactly one item in, in some cases, or a collection of items, whether it's a small collection or a very large number of items, right? Maybe it's eight or 10, maybe it's a million. Uh, and those can be treated differently, but certainly they're very different in some ways from when you expect to get a single response. With uh, the Reactive Streams initiative, uh, you can return uh, any number of things as a publisher. However, with Project Reactor, uh, the publishers are specialized to be either a mono, which is zero or one value, which corresponds to that object of type T, right? Uh, or a flux, which is zero to n values, which is corresponds with that iterable. Uh, and that allows you to have certain operations that apply to both or certain operations that apply more specifically to one or the other. So we're going to return, we're going to issue a request and get a response. Now within the, I, I should take this one step further, with our socket, you have four built-in mechanisms for interactions, for models for interactions, and you can define more, but you have the standard request response. You send one thing, you get one thing. Uh, and then you have a request stream, which is you send one thing, you get back potentially this uh, very long lasting stream of values coming back. You have a fire and forget in which the client, if you will, can send a request and, and not expect anything back, not want anything back. And then you have a channel, a bi-directional channel, which lets you get, uh, send things and receive things equally. Now with our socket there, even though we talk about a client, and a server, an RSocket server, and I defined an RSocket server port for thing one. Uh, there, that's that's a little bit of a false distinction. Initially, of course, you have to have one application that's listening for connection requests. So it acts as a server, and you have to have other applications that will issue connection requests. They'll, they'll request to connect to that other application. So they're considered clients, of course. However, once that connection is established, they're effectively peers. The distinction between the two kind of evaporates. So you can initial initiate conversations from either direction, initiate monologues from either direction. So it's very powerful and very capable. So with that, let's dive right in. Uh, this is a request response. We're going to get, uh, we're going to send one thing and get one thing, right? So, um, and actually in this case, I'm staying with a REST API. So I'm just going to return a, if I can get my fingers on the right keyboard or right keys, a mono of type aircraft. And there we go. And then we'll call this our request response, just for lack of a better uh, way to put it. Now I'm going to need to connect to our, our uh, plane finder application. I'm going to use web client. So I'm gonna create a bean here and we'll make this a reactive web client bean client. My spelling is a, is a hard thing sometimes. So uh, return web client dot create. And I'm going to point this to HTTP colon slash slash local host. And we know this is running on 7634. We know the endpoint is aircraft. So we're just going to now inject that, our web client here. I'm going to use Lombok to do constructor injection because Lombok has an annotation called at all our constructors. So each, uh, each member variable within a class uh, Lombok will, will actually generate a, a, a constructor with a parameter for that member variable, all args. So we have that now. We're going to use that. I'm going to return client.get.retrieve.body2flux, right? Body2flux, body2flux. And that's a flux of type aircraft. And then since I'm returning a mono, a single value, I'm just going to grab the next one. So that looks pretty good. Uh, let's go ahead and start this and test this. This is a very simple kind of just making sure everything connects and then we'll get further into things because this is a very simple concept, but let's take it quickly down into, into more complex territory. Not too complex, just complex enough. 
So first time out of the gate, we're building that. And let me pull up my terminal and let's do this. Oops, I'm in the wrong window. Well, it wouldn't matter, but HTTP colon slash uh, HTTP colon. Again, this is HTTP. This allows me to short circuit some things rather than typing localhost, all that stuff. I'm going to go to 9090 slash rec resp and we'll see what we get. We get a single value, which is exactly what we expected. We issue a request, we get a response. And this is a little bit of a, a you know, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but I think it's a very good, simple start. So let's take this a step further. I'm going to actually change this from an at rest controller to a controller because this allows me to then turn around and make this, instead of doing an at mapping, make this a message mapping so that then I can use this via our socket from another thing. So typically with message mapping, you again, you pass something, you get something. In this case, it's not just the request. We're going to pass in a mono of type instant because I like to, I, you typically pass some data and I like to provide a timestamp here just so I can see when the request comes in. It's just, for me, it's kind of nice to see that. So I'm going to take that timestamp mono and I'm going to do on next. So when we get that in, we take that and I like to just, again, see what's going on. For demos especially, it's very valuable to see what's going on. So I'm going to uh, put a clock in here. So I'll grab that. And then I'm going to, from there, do a then many, which takes a publisher as a parameter. We happen to have a publisher lying around right here, right? And then, I'm just going to close that off. Oops, not there. And there we go. And now we will get a request, we'll return a response. However, and again, kind of close on time. I'm going to go ahead and skip this. We may have may come back to this, but I'm effectively going to be doing the same thing, only better here next. Because now I want to define what happens when we request, send a request and get a stream of responses back. So let's do a request stream. We're still getting a single thing, in this case, a mono timestamp. We're still printing that out. I'm going to change the clock here just so we uh, can keep this straight. Clock. I don't necessarily encourage you to, uh, to fill your logs with emojis, but I think for demos, it's super helpful because it really breaks through and lets you see what's going on. So I'm going to, uh, in this case, I'm going to return all of the aircraft that we have that we're receiving. So I get in the timestamp mono, I retrieve, I return. Uh, then mini get retrieved body to flux and I'm not really sure. Oh, because I'm returning a flux. There we go. That's much happier. So I'm going to move this off to the side. And then what I'm going to do is restart this. Oh, in a moment. And I'm going to create thing two so we can interact with it. Now, each time that a, an RSocket server gets a connection and then loses the connection, a client disconnects, even though it's a fully intentional, uh, there, there comes this, uh, this rather large volume of, of feedback that says, hey, I've lost the client connection and there may be something wrong here. Well, we actually want to uh, just capture this and, and um, just indicate that we've lost that connection or the client connection has been closed. So client connection closed by... And that lets us know that, you know, this is a little cleaner way to exit when we lose or have that connection terminated. So I'm going to go next and open up my thing to, and we will go to thing two. Let me close out some of this, uh, this noise, not so noise. All right, go to thing two, open that up in, I, in our IDE. All right, so thing one is here on our right. Thing two, which we'll use to interact with thing one, is on our left, once it fully loads. IntelliJ must not have had enough coffee yet this morning. <laughs> All right, so we're syncing, we're downloading dependencies. Goodness, goodness. Okay. So just to re recap, we have um, our two endpoints over here, our rec resp, which is our request response. We have our request stream, which is the one we'll really use going forward. Uh, and then we'll take it from there. Now, actually, 
since I have a little bit of time before this comes up, it looks like, I'm going to take this one step further because we're using a reactive web client to interact with Plane Finder, but really what we should or could use is an R socket requester just to get in touch with Plane Finder, even from here. So what I'm going to do is take this up a step because we're going to be using this. Um, well, actually, let me show you. Let me show you in sequence here because this actually does work. It's fine. Uh, it's just that the other way gives you a little more flexibility, but we'll get back to that. So I'm going to go to my Palm and we'll pull up our application properties. In this case, uh, we're going to be using 8080. So that's the default. We don't have to put anything in here. So I'm going to go to my application code. And once again, we'll create our class aircraft. And this is private string call sign reg flight no and type. And we want also our altitude, altitude, heading, and speed, and also our lat and lawn. Once again, that data, uh, all our constructor. And then of course, just in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and create a component here. We'll call this our thing two component. And we'll just see if we can connect to our thing one. So I'm just going to create a post construct method and we will call this rec stream because we're going to just go straight to the stream. Now, in order to connect to this via our socket, what we need to do is create an R socket requester bean. I'm going to, <laughs> typing is a thing, uh, create an R socket requester bean. Now, Spring Boot's auto configuration helps you in many, many ways because the fact that we have here on our class path, we have R socket, right? So just the fact that we have an R socket starter on our class path, Spring Boot will actually inject an RSocket requester builder into our application. We can use that to, and this is why I say this is the easiest way to consume RSocket and to use RSocket in your applications. It's just so nice. So we're going to use that builder and create a TCP connection to localhost. And we're going to use port 7635, no, excuse me, 9091, because this is the port we want to use to connect here our thing one. So we're going to use port 9091. I'm going to in turn inject that bean here to our thing two component. And we'll use that, right? So requester.route. And once again, we're going to point to our route here, which is rec stream, right? We're going to grab that and we'll point to that route because that's where we want to go. I'm going to provide some data, in this case, just a timestamp, as I mentioned before. And then I'm going to retrieve a flux of type aircraft. And I'm going to subscribe to that. And I'm going to take each aircraft and just print that out so we can see what's going on here. Let's see here. There we go. Okay, so airplane, and we'll grab that. And the reason I subscribe, and this goes back to the reactive streams uh, specification, because the reason uh, you would subscribe, of course, I need to use Lombok to inject that, or I can use Lombok to inject that. The reason you subscribe is that while there are hot and cold publishers, and a hot publisher runs all the time, so whether anyone's listening or subscribing to it or not, it's running. And there are valid reasons for hot publishers, but in most cases, uh, if no one's listening, all you're doing with a hot publisher is consuming a lot of resources. So typically a publisher is a cold publisher unless and until a subscriber subscribes to it. And at that point it fires up, it consumes resources and it provides values. So that's what we have here. So I'm going to go ahead and start this and we'll see if we can make this connection between our uh, thing two and thing one. It is a little sluggish this morning. Let's uh, let's all pull for for IntelliJ and my system, my poor overloaded system to uh, to to punch through here. Okay, so we see that it sent a timestamp. This is good. This is exactly what we expected. We sent a timestamp, and let's see what we got back in terms of data. So we have several aircraft uh, coming through. We see that some of them have null call signs. Again, the data doesn't always populate, or if it's a private flight, if it's not a commercial flight, it may be a null call sign. Here's Southwest Airlines. Here's the registration number, the flight number. The type is a Boeing 737. The current altitude is 4,050 feet. 
heading of 89. So it's roughly due east and so on and so forth. So we have exactly what we expected to have. That's that's a good sign, right? So let's go ahead and develop this out further. Let's let's um, 12 minutes, plenty of time. So I'm going to go ahead and create one more message mapping here and make this a bi-directional channel because this is where the fun really begins. I'm going to send back, once again, a flux of aircraft and we'll call this method channel. And I'm going to receive a flux of weather data because that can make things fun. So actually this is a weather flux, right? And of course I haven't defined a weather class yet, so let's do that. Uh, so let's see, class weather. And what's important for weather? Uh, well, let's see, we'll have a, well, let's have the observation time. So when the observation took place, and of course we want the observation itself because that's kind of important. Uh, and I'm just going to copy this so I can use this on the other side. Copy paste is not something I'm proud of, but once in a while it kind of makes sense to do it for time. So I'm going to return. I'm going to process this weather flux and um, do on subscribe. I like to grab this uh, subscription and just note that we are subscribed, right? So subscribe to weather. And then uh, on the next value, I'll grab that weather value and then I will just print that out so we can see that. Now, it's nice to have sunny weather when you're flying. So I'm just going to put a sun there and the weather report. We'll print that out. And then I'm going to switch things up. I'm going to receive a value or a value from that weather flux. And I'm going to send back a different, uh, a different response. So a flux of aircraft in this case, client, client. Dot get retrieve dot body body to flux of type aircraft and there we have it right okay so that's not happy for some reason oh of course because I'm getting the weather value in and then I'm responding with the flux now before I go any further because I I mentioned this before what we're doing from thing two to thing one is using an R socket requester to request values from thing one. However, thing one, we're actually using a reactive web client instead of doing a full on R socket stream connecting all of them. And I'd like to fix that at this point. So before we go any further, I'm just going to kill that. And we're going to make this an R socket requester as well uh, using the builder. And I'm going to now return builder.tcp. We're going to establish a TCP connection to local host, uh, and then this is 7635 here, right? So that should work. And then we'll take this and use this here. Uh, and instead of web client, what I'm going to do is inject our, our socket requester so we can use that. This necessitates a couple of coding changes, right? But it's no big deal. We'll just take this and change this to a requester dot route and the route in this case is AC stream, so that's our aircraft stream. We'll provide a timestamp because again, I think that's kind of useful. And then instead of using body to flux, which is not a valid method here uh, on our socket, we will use the retrieve flux. Very simple, very clean and kind of a one-on-one -on -one replacement, but with far more capabilities as we'll see shortly. So I'm going to do this, request a route, AC stream, Provide data of instant dot now. And again, your choice. I just like that. Uh, retrieve flux. And then once again here, same thing. And we'll grab this and do a requester dot route AC stream data instant now and change this to retrieve flux. Perfect. Okay, so let's restart that. And then let's go to our thing two, and we'll just uh, create another method here. So void channel, and let's do a requester.route. In this case, it's channel on the other side and thing one. Uh, and then we want to provide some data. Now we're, we're expecting to provide weather data, right? So I'm going to grab this because I think I uh, copy pasted one time too many here. And then just paste this in. And we're going to generate some data. I like live data, however, I think with weather, most of the time they make it up anyway, so why not? So a list of string, and there we go. We'll call this our observation list. So these are our observations. So list.of, 
Um, let's say the first one is the ideal case. Sky's clear, visibility, 10 statute miles. That sounds nice, right? And the next one, let's say, is um, broken. So that's cloudy, broken, uh, half to, to uh, three-fourths uh, coverage of the sky at um, nine zero. So that's 9,000 feet. Visibility, eh, let's say visibility is good, not quite as nice, but eight statute miles. And then let's say overcast, which is just a solid solid ceiling of, of clouds at um, 300 feet. That's terrible, right? So visibility is half statute miles. So that's not so great, but it's what we have to work with. So random, uh, I'm going to create just some randomness here because randomness is fun, makes things interesting. And then I'm going to, for our data, I'm going to just generate a flux at an interval of one per second, right? And then I'm going to map each of those values to a new weather. And then I'm going to, for weather, just do an instant dot now, because that's our when the weather was taken. And then for our observation, I'm just going to grab an observation off the list using our random, right? Next int and the observation list size. And that gets us the data. Then we'll retrieve a flux of type aircraft and subscribe. We'll take our aircraft, we'll subscribe to that, and I'm going to use a different airplane. We'll use this one, right? Why not? Come on, poor little machine. There we go. Plus AC, and there we have it. And for whatever reason, that is unhappy, but it shows just fine. Oh, uh, let's see. So I need to do oh, it's instructor, and I can construct an aircraft or a weather. So let's go ahead and run this. We should be connected all the way through via our socket, end to end, thing two to thing one to thing to, to plane finder. It is trying to restart. So we're getting a, or we're sending a weather observation from thing two to thing one. Thing one is dutifully sending back all aircraft that it finds at the point of, of receiving a weather observation. And everything is talking quite nicely. So let me go ahead and close this out. I'm actually, while I think of this now, just to, again, make things cleaner on this side, I'm going to do the same thing and just do a, there we go, hook, stop on, error drop, grab the error and just do, uh, just show that we have a connection closed. And that cleans that up for when we go to the next phase, because now we have thing one and thing two communicating and that's beautiful, right? But that's, well, it's, I've shown you actually, we've discussed one and I've shown, well, actually we, we actually showed, uh, three different ways, right? So we, we actually used HTTP based, uh, interactions. We've used, um, um, uh, fluxes and monos. So we've used uh, reactor and uh, reactive streams implementation. We've also used our socket building on reactive streams implementation. But now what I want to do is take this a step further and go via messaging platforms, right? So I'm going to fire up thing three. Uh, do I want to do that first? Sure. Why not? Okay. So for thing three, uh, let me go back here and we'll open up thing three project. We have five minutes left. That's plenty of time. So we'll go to thing three. And of course, it opens in the wrong screen. So let's drag this over here. I'm going to put that in front of thing one because thing one is just happily running in the background now. So we can ignore that, thankfully. Uh, so it's starting up. While that's starting up, I'm going to go ahead and build out thing two to, to integrate with our messaging platform. Now, I included Rabbit. I was hoping to get to uh, several different options here, uh, but we'll go with Rabbit for now and we'll see where time takes us. But Rabbit, or excuse me, uh, Spring Cloud Stream includes a really cool concept called the Stream Bridge. And this is included just by including the dependencies in your project for Spring Cloud Stream. Uh, so it makes it kind of nice to be able to bridge different mechanisms for passing, uh, passing messages through into and retrieving them out of messaging platforms. So, I'm going to uh, just inject a stream bridge in here. So we'll call that bridge. And again, we're using at all our constructor for Lombok. So it automatically adds that to our constructor. So then we can take on our channel when we're retrieving that flux, we'll just do on next. And for each one of our aircraft that comes in, we'll use our bridge 
to send that aircraft to something. So we need to provide a binding name. I, you can call it whatever you want. What I like to do is call it, call it something that's um, typically formatted the way Spring Cloud Stream likes. So you have the, the name of the method or function. Uh, you indicate whether it's an output channel or an input channel and the number. And in this case, we only have one. It's zero offset, so we start with zero. And then I'm going to send the AC to it, the aircraft. And that's really pretty much it. I don't want to start this just yet, but what I do want to do is go to here and define our Spring Cloud Stream bindings and send AC out zero in this case. The destination, I'm going to call that a, a queue or exchange and topic rather, in this case for Rabbit, called aircraft. And that's really all I need to do. So I'm ready to go there. Let's go back here to thing three. And this is pretty simple, really. So I'm going to go to my application properties. In this case, I want to define the port as, so I don't have a port conflict, 7070, uh, because I now have several applications running. I have to keep that, uh, keep that clean. And then let's go to our application. And then again, wait, we're really close on time. So I'm going to do something again I don't like to do, but I will do it in this case. Just one off. Good thing this isn't recorded, right? <laughs> uh, I'm going to copy paste in. <laughs> And then let's go ahead and create our at um, component, component, no, configuration, configuration, typing is hard. We'll call this our thing three config class. And then I'm going to create a bean here, which is a consumer bean of type aircraft. So we're going to be consuming aircraft. There we go. There we go. We'll just call this log it. And I'm going to uh, grab the aircraft and just print it out, right? So we'll grab this airplane and do that. And now we have log it. And once again, I need to define my bindings or log it. In this case, it's an input channel. We're going to be receiving values and the destination destination is aircraft as we defined over here on the other side. I'm also going to set up the group and group is not required, but what this allows you to do is create multiple instances in this case of thing three, and they implement the competing consumer pattern because they're in a consumer group. So that works. All right, let's go ahead. Well, hopefully it works. We'll find out. Let's go ahead and start that. And we'll go ahead and restart our thing two. Thing two will interact with thing one over our socket, which interacts with Plane Finder over our socket, which is a Spring Native app running in a container. And then thing three is receiving values via uh, RabbitMQ, in this case, over a stream bridge from thing two. So here we go. Look at that. So everything is just passing through beautifully, as it always does, right? Everything always works perfectly the first time. <laughs> But it works. And this is really, a, really a nice example. Again, you can use a lot of different options in terms of messaging platforms. Spring Cloud makes it super simple and easy. Uh, I like to show there's just no time, but I like to show event hubs because it is a robust industrial strength, a resilient and, and distributed um, messaging platform around the world. You know, it's, it's available in numerous different uh, uh, regions uh, at, at, at scale. Uh, but again, we're just out of time. If you want to know more, however, uh, I have a link to the repo. I'm going to go ahead and pull that back up. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, oh, went back to the beginning. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, that's my bad. There we go. Yeah, so here is the repo. If you want to check that out, please do. That has today's code, and I will be updating that, keeping that fresh, adding new things as we go. So uh, watch that, star that, so you get notified of updates. If you want to reach out to me, again, email works. Twitter is better, so just ping me on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter, and I share good stuff as I find it, as well as some occasionally amusing anecdotes. Um, but anyway, thanks so much for coming. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to DevOps Ukraine. Hope to see you in person again really soon. Stay safe and keep that code flowing. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, uh, for, for your talk. Uh, I suggest, uh, dear participants, and you, Mark, to join the Q&A uh, discussions so people can ask questions uh, and actually have a live discussion with you if they want to. So you can find the link to the discussion uh, in the discussion part of the menu at Rocket. 
So thank you once again for supporting Devox Ukraine this year. It was a pleasure to, to meet you online, yeah, and hope maybe we can meet in person. Wow, yeah, you have our branded T-shirt that looks great. Yes, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, so thank you once again. And uh, yeah, uh, please continue the discussion in the Q&A room. See you in the room. <laughs> <laughs>